Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. You are. I like your sweater. Thank you. Good colors. Thank you. Uh, First up, uh, just a couple quick things before we get into our horror stories. Um, Coming in late due to recording in advance, of course, but thanks so much to everyone who came out to Sacramento and Colorado for the Burn It All Down stand-up show. So fun. Such a great weekend. Yeah, it was very epic. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, Pontiac, Michigan, Indianapolis, New Orleans, Philly, Cleveland, and Columbus are coming up next. Woohoo! Uh, now for this week's merch announcement, new Witching Hour collection in store now. I really love this design. I love all of them, but this is this one really like, ooh, it's a little different. Fun retro line of cut style design featuring three witches and pointy red hats dancing around a campfire. Uh, very cool style and layout on this one. The collection features a tea, canvas, and a new cozy blanket. <laughs> you said tea, and I don't know. I'm like, I knew what you meant, like yeah. a t-shirt. And I was like, a cup of tea with witches in it. Yep. All right. How's that work? Yep. You can use witches get brew. a cup of tea sent to the mail, hot tea showing up <laughs> in the mail. Uh, you can head on over to badmagicmerch.com to check out the new Witching Hour collection. And I believe you have a charity reminder and uh, maybe a quick little scholarship reminder. I have a scholarship reminder and a charity announcement. That charity I announcement. Do. That's right. I knew what you meant. Yeah. And I knew if I just said that, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's the word. Because otherwise, I knew you would also month. think about it and you'd be like, wait a second. <laughs> uh, did you know no. that <laughs> March is National Bed Month? I did not know that. Okay. Now, I know it could sound a bit silly because yeah. it seems like everything has a day or a month anymore. But... Yeah. Uh, I am personally a huge jerk without enough sleep, and I think that mm-hmm. sleep is a really important thing. And, you know, not everyone has access to a bed and a yeah. pillow. And so this month we are donating to Sleep in Heavenly Peace. Uh, sleep in Heavenly Peace is a group of volunteers who build, assemble, and deliver beds to families in need. They have chapters all across the United States. I couldn't quite tell, but I think it may have started in Idaho, just the way some language was written. Oh, cool. they don't They don't claim it, but yeah. just the way I read some things. Uh, but now they're, they're expanded everywhere. And if you want to get involved, if you can offer up your skills, if you, it just costs just, but $250 to make one bed and have it yeah. donated. So if you and your family want to get together and donate, you can visit S H P sleep heavenly peace beds dot org. That's S H P beds dot org. And we'll return back to this yeah. later with our donation amount since we are uh recording in advance. Yeah. We don't know what that dollar amount's gonna be. Roberts and Annabelle's uh, building a lot of new beds for kids. That's awesome. I know it's a really cool thing for kids and families in need. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also an exciting things as a reminder, as of now, right? This is the seventh of March. Yep. Yep. As of yesterday, the Cummins Family Scholarship is now open and accepting applications. So there are three five thousand dollars scholarships available. And to find out if you qualify or if you want to apply, you can visit learnmore.scholarsapply.org backslash Cummins backslash. I know it's yeah. very wordy. It'll be in the episode description exactly. as it has been for the past few weeks. Just click that link. Just click that link. And as a note, uh, please just keep in mind that we wanted this scholarship to be available to a wide variety of people. This is not just for high school seniors attending their first year of college. So go, go over there, see if it yeah. fits your needs. And Non-traditional we- students, welcome. Exactly. And we would love to be able to help you on your journey. And that's that. Good job. Well, thank you, sir. (laughs) Uh, What stories do you have today on the 183rd consecutive scared to death? I have nothing. Nothing? Yeah. That's new. I just decided like, nah, I have enough. Yeah, just wrap it up. You're busy. I get it. (laughs) Could you imagine? (laughs) Uh, Without any warning, I'm like, no, I've come unprepared this week. Uh, Okay. Two stories, uh, much like last week, thematic, unintentionally though, Mm -hmm. this time. Uh, in my first story, we explore just like trusting your gut. Like when something doesn't feel right, Mm -hmm. maybe there's a reason why. Yeah. So listen to your gut. And then in our second story, we have, uh, 
someone who works at a mental health care facility who suspects that something very peculiar is going on. Okay. And maybe it is. Maybe it is. When you said gut, I said the most random thought. Uh, how much would it suck to have a very untrustworthy gut? Like everybody's <laughs> like, trust your gut. Like what if your gut consistently led you astray? Okay, well, I will say that <laughs> that is often true for people. Like when it comes to dating, they're like, why do I keep dating idiots? Oh, it's yeah. like, why do I date bad people? It's like, because you have a shitty gut. <laughs> so step one, get your gut fixed. Step one, step gut two, health. Step two, trust it. Yeah, get your gut in shape. Uh, okay, so my story, my first story is set in a little ski town, perfect for this time of year. I'm going to share the lore of the supposedly very haunted ski town of Crested Butte, Colorado. And then I'll tell a modern encounter story of a man who claims to have picked up and given a ride to one of the area's most infamous spirits. Then I'll take you to the UK, to the rolling green hills of Gloucestershire, England, to visit the strange and haunted unfinished, long unfinished, Woodchester Mansion. Okay. We'll go over some history and some scares over there. Uh, you ready to showcase your very unique socks this week and okay. then get started? These things are over the top. They're over the top. They might be my new favorite unicorns. <laughs> yeah, these... check, check these babies out. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, really, not really built for shoes. Built for just, uh, you know, lounging. Uh, well, they are slipper socks. They do have grippies on the bottom, you know, yeah. for grippy jail. So, uh... <laughs> And a big old unicorn on top. I just love them so much. <laughs> those, are, those are something. Uh, okay. So, decent amount of setup on this first one. Uh, the little 1600-ish person town of Crested Butte, Colorado, feels like it has a lot of second homes, uh, has been billed as the last great ski town in America. Crested Butte started off as a western mining town during the silver booms of the late 19th century, with the first miners arriving in 1880. Uh, coal then began to be mined from the area just a few years later, and the first ski club was formed way back in 1886. And now today, Crested Butte is considered by some to be the most haunted ski town in America, with a number of locations that claim to be frequented by spirits. Two 19th century tragedies are the main origin stories for a lot of the town's paranormal lore. On January 24th, 1884, the Jokerville mine exploded, killing 60 to 70 people. And then just seven years later, in 1891, an avalanche killed dozens more miners. Ever since these two tragedies, ghost sightings have been common. Alleged shadowy apparitions of supposed miners have been and supposedly still are spotted and heard all around town. Crested Butte is also haunted by more than the ghosts of miners. The Forest Queen Hotel on Elk Avenue is reported to be one of the town's paranormal hotspots. This building first opened as a brothel in 1881, so it started quick with the mines. And according to a local legend, three years later in 1884, a man came to town and, quote, swept a local madam off her feet. This woman, identified as Elizabeth in sources, supposedly made the decision one night to hand over her life savings to this man for him to gamble with all of it at the uh, Coach of Ours Saloon next door to the hotel. This doesn't have a good ending. And he actually won big. Uh-huh. And, then, and then the next day he snuck out of town alone and took all of Elizabeth's money with him. And she was so devastated that she jumped out of room number four on the second floor into the Coal Creek River below. Ever since, various guests at the Forest Queen have claimed to feel their beds shaking at night and to sometimes wake up to the feeling of a heavy weight sitting upon their chest. Elizabeth also believed to be responsible for banging pots and pans in the hotel kitchen and slamming doors all around the hotel late at night. Rooms two and three also supposedly haunted. One man claimed that while staying at the hotel one night in room number two, his bed not only shook, but violently jerked back and forth across the floor. He ended up jumping off the bed, turning on the lights, and then watching TV the rest of the night, too scared to try and go back to sleep. And he said that his bed continued to shake at various points throughout the night. I can't believe he managed to stay in the room until morning. And that's brave. Yeah, I think I might be watching TV in the lobby until I needed to uh, leave. Uh, what I wouldn't do is move to a different hotel in Crested Butte. Seems like they're all haunted, like Elk Mountain Lodge. This hotel was constructed in 1919 and originally served as a boarding house for miners. It is believed that the spirits of some of the miners who died while staying at the lodge now haunt it. Another local haunted business is the Slogar, a bar and restaurant where numerous visitors have reported seeing the spirits of saloon girls dancing late into the night. I mean, if you're going to see some ghosts, I guess uh, saloon girls wouldn't be a uh, bad ghost to see. I would have loved to have been a saloon girl. Yeah? Yeah, I think I'd have been so D fun. Dancing up in the saloon? Mostly just the outfits and the hair. Mm, yeah, it's a sexy look. Oh, let's noted. Get, let's get you in a saloon girl costume. Now, now. <laughs> the town also has ghosts not attached to any local structure, uh, but known to wander a certain stretch of the outdoors such as one of the most infamous ghosts in town, 
the hitchhiker. A number of different people driving up the mountain around dawn have reported seeing a man standing on the side of the road near the cemetery between the towns of Gunner and Crested Butte. And some of them have actually claimed that this spirit has climbed into their vehicles and gone for a little ride with them. Some people who've stopped and offered him a ride have reported that he asked to be taken to Gothic, says he lives in Irwin. Gothic is now a ghost town near Crested Butte. Irwin also largely a ghost town. Some stories say that the man looks dirty, doesn't smell all that great, <laughs> seems confused by cars, occasionally calling them wagons. If true, how strange and terrible to be stuck in between life and death like that. Able to interact with the living in the present in a very real way, but not able to understand how the world has changed, stuck in one of those weird loops. Well, the following story is one man's alleged account encounter with this particular entity. Time now for the tale of the phantom hitchhiker of Crested Butte. It was late November, the start of ski season, and Dylan was, Dylan was making the long, over four-hour drive to Crested Butte from Denver. For most of the year, he worked full-time as a freelance graphic designer, but not during ski season. During ski season, his life revolved around being on the mountain as much as possible. He loved skiing. He was good at it. Very good, actually. When he was in college, he entertained dreams of competing in the Olympics. At one point, that dream didn't seem so far off. He was better than most of the guys on his club skiing team, but then a freak accident at high speed shattered his knee and killed that dream. He spent months doing physical therapy and about another two years working to get back to the level he'd been at before the accident. And he did get back there more or less, but by the time he did, it was too late to somewhat realistically entertain any Olympic skiing dreams. Now it was time to focus on graduation and his career. Dylan would continue his graphic design work on a part-time basis while living in Crested Butte for the winter. He also worked as a part-time ski instructor at the resort. He would have loved to do it full-time, but his graphic design work paid too well for him to fully give it up for part of the year. Dylan grew up in Crested Butte, or technically just outside of it. He felt nostalgic every time he drove the familiar streets, seemed like he had a memory or 10 for every spot in town. He pulled up to his childhood home where he would be living for the next several months. His parents had, had, a, had a furnished apartment waiting for him above the garage that they VRBO'd when he wasn't using it, and they tried their best not to be too overbearing when he stayed with them. It was a pretty sweet setup. Dylan planned to celebrate Thanksgiving with his family and start work the Saturday after. He spent the rest of the day settling in and catching up with his parents. The next day, he was supposed to come to the resort to fill out paperwork and get his badge and parking pass. Standard procedure. It was still dark when he left home early in the morning. The sky was dark blue with the first hints of pink and orange streaking the horizon. It would be about a 20-minute drive to the resort. Dylan drove the first half of his journey in silence and then decided to turn on the radio and listen to the weather report since he'd forgotten to check his phone that morning. And right after turning on the radio, as he rounded a curve in the road, he saw a lone figure up ahead. It was hard to make out the details from so far away, but soon he could make out a tall man dressed in suspenders and a hat. He wasn't wearing nearly enough for the current cold and snowy weather. He was standing on the edge of the road, not looking at Dylan's approaching car. He also wasn't sticking his thumb out like he was a hitchhiker. Dylan was conflicted. He felt apprehensive, a little sketched out by this guy. But he also didn't want to abandon someone who looked like they might end up getting frostbite or worse if they didn't get picked up soon. When Dylan got close enough to make out more fine details, he could see that the man looked older, a bit past middle-aged. Dylan now wondered if he was confused and had gotten lost. Some kind of dementia? He gently pushed the brakes, slowing to a crawl as he approached the man. Hey, he called out. Are you okay? Do you need a ride? The man slowly turned his head towards Dylan and nodded solemnly in the affirmative. A worried feeling now settled in Dylan's stomach. Maybe this wasn't such a good, eye after, good idea after all. But it was too late to turn back. He'd asked, and the man had accepted. Now he really wouldn't feel good about leaving him. If something bad happened to this guy, he wouldn't be able to forgive himself. Come on in. He waved his hand, hoping his reluctance didn't show. The man slowly approached the car, walking with a severe limp. He put almost all his weight on his right leg, the left one almost dragging along behind him. Once he made it to Dylan's Subaru, he seemed exhausted from the short walk. It reminded Dylan of how he'd been after his accident when he thought he would never be able to walk normally again. He didn't like the way looking at the man made him feel. His memories were then interrupted by the man climbing into the car and landing on the seat with a grunt. He pulled the door closed and turned to face Dylan. Thank you, he said in a gravelly voice. You're welcome. Are you headed to town? The man hesitated before answering. Yes. An uncomfortable silence closed in on him now. As they drove on, Dylan felt desperate to say something, anything to fill it. 
How come you're out here on the road so early? Did your car break down? Dylan quickly glanced over and saw the man furrowing his brow, a confused expression on his face. Yes, he answered, sounding unsure. You from out of town? No, he said this time confidently. This is where I belong. Okay, this guy's definitely confused, Dylan thought to himself. He wasn't sure what to do. He'd only left with enough time to make it to the resort 15 minutes early, which didn't leave him much time to drop off this man somewhere. And even if he had enough time, he didn't want to dump him at the mechanic and just leave. What if he was too confused to explain where his vehicle was? What if he didn't know where home was? I grew up here too, Dylan said, down the road a ways. Do you know my parents, Cheryl and Martin Jefferson? Dylan saw a flash of recognition in his eyes. I know the Jeffersons. Really? What's your name? I don't recognize you from around town. He hesitated again. My name is... He started, but then trailed off and stared out the window. This only confirmed Dylan's theory that he was lost and needed more than a mechanic's help. Would you like to use my phone? Call your family? Have them meet you in town? No, thank you. A few more minutes of awkward silence passed, awkward for Dylan at least. The man seemed content to look silently out the window. Out of the corner of his eye, Dylan saw the man's hand moving now. He was rubbing his knee on his injured leg. Dylan felt a pang of sympathy. He was probably in a lot of pain. You know, he started, I hurt my leg too, long time ago. Skiing accident in college. I went to this great physical therapist in Denver, and I know there's a few offices in town. I still see someone whenever I get knee pain. I can help you get the office's card if you want. It's too late. He sounded sad when he said that. Dylan wanted to tell him that it was never too late, but he also didn't want to be overbearing. They didn't actually know each other, of course. For some reason, Dylan felt compelled to ask what happened. He hated being nosy, but he just felt like he needed to know. Hesitantly, Dylan said, Do you mind if I ask what happened? I was thrown down the mountain, the man said. Thrown? What did that mean? He didn't add any more details. The sun was rising and people were starting to wake up. The coffee shops were open. The first skiers of the day probably grabbing breakfast before they headed up the mountain. And all filled in with a rush of excitement. Soon he'd be up there with them. Dylan turned right towards the auto shop, pulling into a parking space on the street. Their open sign wasn't on, but he'd been here plenty of times over the years and knew that the owner was already sitting in his office and would answer the door if he knocked. If the man had lived here his whole life, he probably knew the owner too. That was one thing Dylan loved about his hometown. You could always count on people to be reliable and stick to his schedule. Well, we're here, Dylan said, eager to get the man out of his car. Do you need anything else? Are you sure you don't want to call your family? I'm sure. He put his hand on the door, hesitating before opening it. Dylan noticed for the first time that he hadn't put on his seatbelt during the drive. Where are you going? The man asked, turning back to face him. Dylan stared into his eyes for a moment. There was sadness there, but also something else. Curiosity, maybe. I'm going to the mountain, to the ski resort. The man nodded. Be careful on the mountain. Then he swiftly exited the car, shut the door, stood on the sidewalk, and gave Dylan a little wave. And Dylan didn't like the glint in his eye. He sped off quickly, but got stuck at a stoplight. He still had 15 minutes to get to the resort. He'd be in a rush, but he would make it on time. Dylan now checked his rearview mirror and saw that the man was already gone. The tension left his body, relief settling in. That would be the first and last time he picked up a hitchhiker, he decided. The man hadn't really done anything, but still, the encounter just left Dylan unsettled. As Dylan drove up the mountain, he let his thoughts wander. Being reminded of his injury was painful, but it also made him think about his life choices. Having his passion taken away from him for so long only made him value it more when he was able to ski again. When he went crashing down the mountain that day, he thought he was going to die. That was the last thought he had before he landed. He was lucky to get away with a fractured kneecap, torn ACL, other various damage. At least that's what the doctors told him. But was he lucky? Graphic design wasn't what he truly wanted to do for the rest of his life. He wanted to ski and he loved being a ski instructor. He enjoyed meeting new people, doing private lessons, teaching groups of kids who had never been skiing before. It was an impossible fantasy, one he rarely allowed himself to have, but as he drove up the mountain, Dylan imagined himself owning his own ski resort one day. That thought lifted him out of his tense, anxious mood. He walked into the HR office with high spirits, greeting the familiar and friendly faces he'd come to know over the years. Dylan filled out his paperwork, got his updated badge, and was prepared to head back down to run errands. But Shauna, who'd hired him, told him, It's not very busy on the slopes right now, just a few guests. If you wanted to do your first run of the season, now would be a good time. He didn't need any further encouragement. By this time of year, Dylan always kept his gear in his car. He thanked Shauna, almost ran to get his things. He flashed his badge at the ski lift operator, excitement rushing through him. He grew more and more tense as the ski lift ascended the mountain, nervous energy building up within him. Dylan took a moment to look out around the run. The snowy mountains surrounded him, the sun shining down from above, 
There was a slight breeze in the air, but not too strong. Almost perfect conditions. Once off the lift, Dylan took a calming breath, checked his helmet straps one last time, dug his poles into the snow, and pushed off, gaining more and more speed as each second passed. Adrenaline rushed through him as he turned and started flying down the black diamond. And then he split off into some trees. Muscle memory kicked in, and his body anticipated everything he needed to do. It was almost as easy as breathing to him. Dylan was cutting back and forth, back and forth at a good speed, digging into a, a lot of fresh powder. As he popped around a big dip and curve, a dark flash further out in the trees now caught his eye. His head snapped left and he did a double take. A man, no, the man, the man he'd picked up was standing off to his left in the trees, watching him. The distraction nearly sent Dylan into a tree himself, but he twisted his skis, dug, out, dug in and cut around it at the last moment. Adrenaline surged through him, and not due to his near miss. He was afraid for a different reason. How had the man followed him without a car? How had he snuck past security, the ski lift operator, and the staff working at the top of the slopes? It seemed impossible, but there he was. He didn't have any gear on. What was he doing? Maybe it was just his imagination. Dylan tried his best to refocus on the path ahead. Being distracted was dangerous. He popped out of the trees and reconnected with the main run. He began another series of sharp curves. Dylan had rounded the last of them when out of nowhere the man's figure suddenly appeared right in the middle of the slope about 50 feet ahead. Dylan's body jerked in fear. He only had a few seconds before he'd hit this man and possibly kill him. Instinctively, Dylan swerved to the right, but in his panic, he turned too hard and the edge of his ski caught the slope hard and he was violently launched into the air and then sent tumbling down the mountain as his skis popped off. Dylan's left leg was horribly twisted almost immediately. He screamed in pain. It was broken, again. He only hoped it wasn't the knee this time. Dylan was in complete agony, but he knew that he had to try his best to keep calm and do a self-assessment. He didn't think he was bleeding. He hoped he wouldn't go unconscious from the pain, which happened to him when he'd had his previous accident. He checked his surroundings, vision blurry from his watering eyes. That man was nowhere to be seen. Dylan now managed to call the ski patrol for assistance. They assured him they'd be there in less than 10 minutes. He could feel himself beginning to lose consciousness. The pain was so overwhelming it actually made him nauseous. Black spots filled his vision. Just before he blacked out, Dylan swore he heard footsteps crunching against the snow around him, but he was too weak to look. He woke up a few moments later and saw the ski patrol racing towards him. They gave him emergency medical assistance and brought him down the trail where he was transported to the hospital. The doctors confirmed what Dylan already knew. His leg was broken and he couldn't ski for the rest of the season. At least it wasn't his knee this time. It was his femur. Clean break, easier recovery. When asked how he'd gotten into an accident... He said he'd swerved to avoid what he thought was a fox. A bit unusual, but not as unusual as some sort of phantom hitchhiker. Dylan was stuck in his parents' apartment for the next two months, wallowing in misery. He felt like he was reliving a memory of the past and had to constantly remind himself that it was real. He had plenty of time to think, to wonder about the man he saw that day. Dylan knew he had picked up a hitchhiker on the morning of his accident, but he didn't know, not for sure, if he had seen that same man on the mountain. Almost weirder, if he had seen two different men, neither dressed for the weather, both super strange, and one just, what, teleporting around the woods or something? He tried his best to convince himself that the second man he saw was just his imagination, that the hitchhiker's weird affect and appearance had gotten to him. Besides, why would that man want to hurt him? He'd given him a helpful ride after all. What bothered him the most was the footsteps he heard as he was passing out. Those had to have come from that man, right? What did he do to him? And then, a few months after his injury, he finally heard about the legend of the Crested Butte Hitchhiker. How had he never heard about that growing up? Was that who he saw that day? When that guy said he was thrown down the mountain, did he mean he had died in some avalanche? Would he see him again when he went back to his work as an instructor after all his PT? Which was exactly what he planned on doing. Ay ay ay, does that make you nervous to ski? Yeah, I don't like hearing about like bad, bad accidents. I try not to think about that like uh, when I do go. Mostly like knee stuff. I know. I mean, just because of like... Because um, you're old? <laughs> yeah, a little. I mean, uh, you, you know, you don't recover as fast. Yeah, and it's like you're old. <laughs> and it just, um, you know, I mean, they have obviously great PT and everything, but, yeah, you, but don't, knees you don't necessarily are... fully recover. You know, I think oftentimes you don't fully recover. Yeah, knees are particularly awful. Yeah, I would like to keep my knees uh, intact. Oof. Um, I, th I think most people would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think there's anybody out there be like, I, I wish mine would explode. <laughs> oh my I God. hate my knees. God. Uh, <laughs> oh, I never even thought about the fact of like, uh, or not the fact, the idea of breaking, like being out on a slope or run, yeah. whatever, I don't ski, uh, being out there and it's not very busy. Yeah. 
and you have a really bad fall, like how did he even call for ski patrol? I don't even cell phone. They usually have a uh, pretty good self coverage or wow. cell phone coverage, excuse me, uh, at ski resorts, probably partially for that reason. Yeah, it just makes me so anxious to think about the fact that you could just pass out from the pain, which of course is, I mean, makes sense. But oh, like, yeah. if there's not a lot of people around, like it could be a while. I know. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. That would be bad if there wasn't that many people. I mean, I do like going on runs that are not like crowded, yeah. but there's a fair amount of people mm -hmm. because I, I find in general other skiers and snowboarders like pretty helpful. Like they well, watch yeah. out for each other. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like, that's part of the etiquette of it all. Yeah. A couple of times ago, like I wiped out on some little uh, catch track. I was trying to like, I got a little too confident and tried to turn and talk to somebody and just like, nope, wasn't paying attention to what my skis were doing and they were no longer parallel to one another. <laughs> and then by the time I realized that, I was like, I just had that thought of like, oh shit. Right before I just whoop, like slammed into the ground. And, but like within two seconds, yeah, this lady had stopped next to me. She's like, you okay? You know, like they're, yeah, they're pretty, pretty helpful. Okay, good. Don't go anywhere where you're not supervised. And no skiing no, I'm not, alone. I'm not good enough. Yeah. Like always go with a buddy. Buddy system. Buddy system. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. No, I wouldn't want to go alone. Yeah, I'm not nearly good enough. Okay, great. Just, <laughs> just clarify. <laughs> okay. Tell me. I have a few pictures. Um, this first one is just, a, it's just a cool looking little uh, ski wow, town. Wow. So pretty. Mm -hmm, just a big ass Colorado mountains <sighs> you know, in the background. So beautiful. Yeah, I just went to, uh, I, I don't, Lovely, I've never been right? to this one. Yeah, but I went to the first little ski place outside of Idaho with my buddy after the Denver show in Loveland, which is, I guess, like the locals. It's not like one of the big, like Aspen, Vail. Right. It's small, but I liked it because it wasn't that crowded. Mm -hmm. uh, a little more subdued, wasn't really a village. Yeah. But it was, um, it was so high. I want to say, hopefully I'm not making this up. I want to say one of the peaks we could look across and see was around 14,000 feet. My God. I thought that's what he said. Maybe, hopefully I'm not making it. But anyway, it seemed like we were above the tree line because there was like trees at the bottom half of the runs, but above uh -huh. was just um, just like those rocky peaks. Monroe and I were talking about, right, because the kids weren't with us. And yeah. she was asking like, oh, how was dad skiing? And I was like, yeah, and like he said, it was good. It was really hard. And then she explained to me what I didn't know about mm. like black diamonds and double, ba oh double God, yeah. blacks. Because she was like, oh, yeah, I did a black diamond on Sunday. She's like, but, you know, that's at Mount Spokane. That's like nothing. And I didn't. I thought that it was like a universal system. I don't and know she, how they decide. Well, she explained it to me that it's like a black diamond is the hardest. Like like if you're at this resort, whatever that black oh. diamond is, it's the hardest of the mountains, the runs at that place. Got and it. that doesn't necessarily equate to this over here. So right. it's not a universal system oh. of like this height yeah. or this many turns or whatever yeah. like this many dips or bowls or whatever yeah. it's like no on this mountain so Monroe was like yeah she's like Black Diamond Mount Spokane it's like oh, might as well be doing okay. like a blue run oh okay because I, yeah, I know like I encountered a black at, at um, Loveland and it was like the guy I was following just didn't realize how inexperienced I was yeah and it was the end of the day and the altitude like I was just I was tired we had done like four hours of continuous runs yeah and I popped I fell for the first time on my last run to the start off of the chairlift. And it wasn't because it was like a, I messed up. It was like my legs were like, nope. Yeah, we're just tired. Just so tired. And then I'm like, well, it's the last run. I just got to make it down just the do hill. It, just do it. But then I didn't realize we were going in this crazy loop of these cat tracks, which kind of like connect runs. So you're going like a horizontal across the mountain. Yeah. And it was just the longest, like these big hills and dips. And I'm like, okay, making it through that. But it was a little tough just for me. And then he's like, oh, we'll just traverse across the mountain. I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then I realized, that, and then now we're just going like horizontally across a bunch of runs, like through the woods. I'm like, what are we doing? And I'm so tired. And then when we got to the very end where it's like, now you get back down to the base of the mountain, it was a black diamond. And I was just like, are you kidding me? It just looked like a cliff. Ah. So I, so I tried to slowly go back and forth, but it was exhausting. And then I was just like, you know what? No pride. Just pop my skis off. And on my butt just scooched down. Took me about a half an hour, probably. So cute. <laughs> I think that's like the most adorable little thing. Uh, I have two more pictures. Um, this first one, supposed haunted hotel of the Forest Queen. The so Forest I like that, Queen. It looks like an old front. saloon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like old mining town. Yeah, classic mining town kind of uh -huh. vibe from the West. I mean, it, it looks like it could just be like on the Disney Ranch. Which totally. is like, you know, right where you go to film Westerns. Uh, and then this, this last one, supposedly haunted Elk Mountain Lodge. I think this one's in the winter. Yeah, just to show the amount of snow. I mean, the snow like is over six feet high there. They have to carve tunnels that go above people's heads for like the pathways. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, just so much snow. That's so cool. So much. I love it. Uh, any questions? Uh, questions, comments, concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, this story reminded me of like that. We actually just recently talked about this story, the Uber driver who like, Oh, yeah. yeah. Except this one, the spirit was way more interactive. I know. Really fascinating. The smell 
the the, mm, the smell the of the spirit. Of smells, yeah, yeah that, was odd. that was really. I'm like, oh, is that like ghost bo? <laughs> like, I mean, that's something that I haven't heard before. We hear of foul odors, like, oh, yeah, you know, there was some evil spirit, and there was the smell of like rotten eggs, sulfur, but and like perfumes and stuff. Sometimes will accompany oh, spirits. That's true. That's true. But but I but not a but like not a body odor. Yeah, exactly. Not like, like a sweat. But I guess if you were going to smell some some things perfume. B.O. would be in that same area, just whatever smell comes off of them. Yeah, yeah. I guess. I don't know. It was just kind of cracking me yeah. up in my head. Uh -huh, I was like, uh -huh. oh, stinky ghost. Go stinky, take a shower. Stinky ghost. Yes. Also, I liked your little voice that you did for him. And I would very much like you to just do voice work. I think you should just give up all your careers uh -huh. that you have. And just, 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 just try become a voice a actor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be fun to actually kind of like focus on it. I remember early on, I mean, this is, this is dating me. This was like, because uh, it was a CD, not streaming, oh. but, but it was a CD of- Like I said, you're old. Dialects. And I would listen to it in the car. Of course you would. Uh-huh. Like early on in stand-up, trying to work on different dialects. And I will say, like, I don't spend, if I spend enough time on one, I can get it pretty good. Like when I, when I was going to school in London, the, I by the end of the three months, just practicing that one all the time, I could convince people that I was local. But, I but if don't I just, believe that. No, because I don't practice enough. Uh-huh. And so they're kind of just goofy now. Uh-huh. I know. I know. Mm -hmm. Okay, you uh, yeah, ready to uh, head on over to England? Please don't try and do any accents here. <laughs> what if I did start doing that? I'm scared of that all the time. Just quite a bit of history uh, history to go over with this story. Deep in the heart of the rolling green hills of Gloucestershire. Ah, I'm going to stop. Well, that's Australian. Gloucestershire, yeah. England, lies the beautiful but long unfinished 19th century Woodchester mansion. Yeah, that's still not English. That's uh, something. Uh, <laughs> it's a building <laughs> built on long inhabited grounds. A uh, settlement in the Woodchester Valley dates back at least as far as Roman times, as evidenced by the remains of a Roman villa in the local churchyard. Uh, Woodchester Mansion is located in Woodchester Park on the opposite side of the valley from the village of Woodchester. Wow. Just about 1,200 people. I know, Woodchester, Woodchester. Um, uh, in 1564, the Crown granted ownership of the park to the Huntley family, and the Huntleys had a hunting lodge built around 1612. In 1631, the new lodge passed to the Ducey family, and they would own the property for the next two centuries and transform the lodge into a Georgian house called Spring Park Mansion. Their estate was eventually acquired by a Mr. William Lay for £170,000 in 1845. Lay moved to Gloucestershire with the goal of creating a Catholic community in the area, as he had recently converted. He wanted to construct a church and monastery near his estate, and that is exactly what he did. His church was finished in 1849, the monastery in 1853. Lay would also have the Spring Park Mansion demolished to make room for the new Woodchester Mansion, and work began on that mansion in the 1850s. Lay worked with architect Charles Hansom for several years, and then eventually Benjamin Bucknell, one of Hansom's employees, took over. But then in 1868, work on the mansion suddenly stopped for unknown reasons. According to local lore, the workers not only stopped working, but they fled the grounds, left their tools at the work site, never returned to collect them. And now today, visitors can still find Victorian-era tools inside the mansion, ladders propped up against the walls, fireplaces suspended in the air, sudden drop-offs on the upper floor. No one knows for certain why their work halted, but it was rumored uh, that the workmen left due to terrifying ghost encounters. William Lay would die in January of 1873 without having work resumed and completing the mansion. Upon his death, his son Willie inherited the property. After receiving estimates for the cost of completing the mansion, Willie realized it would actually be cheaper to build a brand new house in Woodchester Park, so there would be no finishing it. Maintaining the mansion would also require him to earn far more than what he was making at the time, so the mansion fell into a state of disrepair. After Willie's death, his daughter Blanche took temporary ownership and hired someone to improve the estate and proposed finishing the mansion, but then before work could be done, Willie's second son Vincent took ownership uh, of his father's when his father's estate was finally formally settled, and work on the old mansion resumed, but only one room was ever completed before it stopped again. In 1894, a drawing room was finished in preparation for a visit from the Archbishop of Westminster, and something happened once again that stopped construction. More rumors of ghosts. Vincent sold the estate in 1922, and then 13 years later, his sister Blanche once again took ownership and quickly sold the estate to the Barnwood House Hospital for Mental and Nervous Disorders. The institution planned on finally finishing the old building, but then Barnwood House also never went through with their plans for finishing the mansion for unknown reasons. Yet again, more rumors of disruptive ghosts. During World War II, the property was used by soldiers for training, and then Barnwood House sold the property in 1953 uh, without, you know, attempting to finish construction. 
and no subsequent owner has ever completed construction either. In 1988, the Stroud District Council purchased the property and the Woodchester Mansion Trust was established. And what remains today is an incomplete but beautiful structure made almost entirely of local limestone. The mansion appears frozen in time. Due to the building being unfinished, it is possible to see Victorian-era construction techniques. The beauty of the Gothic-style building draws tourists from miles around, but some of the tourists aren't there just to look at historic architecture and construction techniques. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Woodchester Mansion. The reputation of this building being haunted goes back as far as anyone can remember and continues today with many reports ranging from strange feelings to actual sightings of apparitions. According to one legend, in 1840, while the second Earl of Ducey was hosting a dinner party to celebrate his new earldom, his father's ghost appeared in the seat at the head of the table, visible to all present. This frightened the Earl so much he moved out and never returned. At another point in the mid-19th century, a caretaker brought their dog to the mansion. They watched their dog sit on the sofa, start wagging his tail as it looked towards the other side of the room as if it saw a friendly face, but the caretaker didn't see anyone around. The dog then deliberately licked the air, and although the caretaker couldn't see a soul, the dog acted exactly as it would as if it was licking someone's hand. Strange scenes like this have played out frequently in the mansion over the years. The many spirits of Woodchester Mansion are said to include a young girl who's often heard singing old Irish folk songs, the spirit of a short man believed to be a stonemason who once worked on the grounds, a young man who appears to be hiding from someone, a man searching for someone, an American airman, a floating head, a horseman on the driveway, and more. These are just some of the spirits uh, who have been cited and made it into the written lore. Loud bangs and knocks have often been heard by visitors. Small stones are said to have inexplicably seemed to have dropped from the ceiling or floated horizontally through the air. Strange lights are often seen around the property. And there are reports of the smell of recently extinguished candles, music coming from nowhere, and a girl singing in the chapel. Several mediums who have visited the mansion have sensed the presence of soldiers. The apparition of the short man is usually seen in the chapel. He often looks like he's concerned about something. Some theorize that this former stonemason may be the one throwing stones at visitors. The men who appear to be searching and hiding are said to appear in the kitchen. The tall man stands in the kitchen doorway and is sometimes said to lean towards the direction of the young man who is seen also in the kitchen. Additionally, there are reports of a young girl skipping up and down the staircase and of a young woman appearing in the first floor corridor. There are also reports of an old woman who seems to like to grab female visitors who come to the mansion at night, and rumors that during the 1970s, groups of people entered the building after dark to use the chapel for occult rituals. And now ever since, the chapel has been the location of sightings of a hooded figure. The land has reportedly never been blessed, which may explain the lingering presence of many spirits. Why it hasn't been blessed has never been made clear. Uh, the mansion remains open to visitors and holds many public ghost hunts, so perhaps a blessing would be bad for business. Before leaving the lore of Woodchester Mansion, let me share a few sightings in a bit more detail. Uh, during the Second World War, Woodchester Mansion served as a base for British and Canadian troops who utilized the nearby lake to practice their bridge building skills uh, in preparation for D-Day landings scheduled to take place in Normandy. It is said that one day during training, some of these soldiers lost their lives in an accident on the lake, and now their ghosts have long since been blamed for many of the noises heard at night. In 2010, a ghost hunter caught a fascinating photograph while sitting alone in a cold, forbidding corridor on the upper floor. The visitor had broken off from the group, which came to the mansion that night for a ghost hunt. The man was a skeptic, had volunteered to go alone when the guide asked if anyone wanted to do a solo vigil. The alleged photograph reveals the profile of a man wearing glasses and what looks like a Canadian aviation hat. Author and paranormal investigator Wayne Spurrier wrote, In the darkness of the corridor, the pale, gaunt outline of the features are visible with a dark shadow around the head which, upon inspection, creates the impression that the figure is wearing a hat or a cap. The detail is so spectacular that it even appears to show a pair of spectacles upon the face and the white of the man's bared teeth from an almost sneering smile. Other photographs were taken before and after that showed nothing unusual, but this image is allegedly one of the clearest images of a ghost ever caught on camera, a specter thought to be the ghost of one of those soldiers who died in that training accident. On July 22, 2016, Haunted Happenings, a paranormal investigative team, led a public ghost hunt on the mansion. In the mansion. Uh, a team of investigators from the U.S. were also in attendance, and they managed to record a clear sound made by a spirit. The 27 total members all made their way down the rickety wooden steps to the cellars, where a psychic medium would attempt to get a feel for different energies in the room. Their feet landed on a stone floor, slightly covered in sand, 
and the group faced a long, dark corridor lined with archways. The cellars were ominous and enough to make anyone feel disconcerted. Once in the cellars, the team conducted a vigil. Everyone in attendance held hands, and a circle began to call out for any spirits present to show themselves. The hauntings, the Haunted Happenings crew had an EMF detector, and the American investigators also brought a recording device. Faint noises and knocks were heard as the vigil began. Soon, three people with their backs turned to the entrance started to feel the presence of someone behind them. The group pressed on, continued to ask the spirits to contact them. Finally, the circle was broken, and the screams of the ghost hunters filled the old halls as an incredibly loud, guttural moan echoed throughout the basement. Spurrier wrote, Without warning, the loudest exhale of a man's breath filled the room, echoing throughout the corridor. It was a guttural sound, seemingly emitted from the very pit of the stomach, and in the darkness, quite terrifying. The people who heard it screamed, and those who were closest to the doorway rushed towards the center of the circle, holding tightly to each other's hands. Spurrier initially suspected that it must have been one of the men in the room who had made the noise and just wasn't admitting to it. But upon reflection, he thought about how he had heard the noise very close to his left ear, and no men had stood to his left. One more, uh, Spurrier again, uh, the head of a paranormal investigative team that runs some of the ghost hunts at the mansion recalled the first time he saw an actual ghost on the grounds. He said it was about 10 minutes after midnight. He was in the middle of a ghost hunt, and so far all had been quiet, excluding a few unexplained noises and minor light anomalies. He had just gathered together a group outside the entrance to the kitchen, and from their position, they could look down two corridors, one leading to the cellars and one leading to the back entrance heading towards the chapel. Moonlight shone through the large windows and into these dark, foreboding corridors. Wayne had taken his torch out and turned it on for a moment in order to give the rest of his team a feel for their position in the mansion. As he turned around to face the corridor leading to the chapel, the torch briefly landed on a tall figure of a man walking across the corridor, silhouetted, silhouetted by the moonlight. Wayne turned the torch back just a second later and the corridor was empty. Wayne now spun around to face the people with him. One woman next to him had obviously also seen the figure as she rushed down the corridor to investigate. Wayne followed closely behind, and of course, there was nobody there. There would also be nowhere else for a person to go, and the team Wayne was leading were the only people present in that area of the mansion. There were two other groups that night, but they were far away in order to reduce noise pollution and mistaken sightings. Wayne and the woman both agreed as to what they just saw. No physical physical details were visible. The man was a dark figure, about six feet in height, and he was walking across the end of the corridor leading from the chapel area of the mansion. They agreed that he crossed the doorway much like a marching soldier. Soldier, And finally, they agreed there had been no sound. A tall man had somehow walked near them on the floor of an old corridor acoustically prone to amplifying an echoing sound, and yet there had been no footsteps heard. There are many more stories like these. Woodchester Mansion seems to be a paranormal hotspot in the rural valley of Woodchester Park, haunted by a variety of elusive spirits from various periods of its long and unusual history. I like it. I like a little history. Yeah. A little history, a little, uh, little snippets of uh, encounters. I do find it fascinating. I mean, it makes sense that they would never have the land blessed, but I, I wonder what would happen if they did. Mm-hmm. Like, would it stir things up? Would it, would it calm things? It can go both ways. I know. I kind of want them to do it. Just experiment. <laughs> uh, before I show any pictures, unfortunately, I was not able to locate the supposedly uh, very clear picture of the ghost allegedly taken uh -huh. in 2010. It, it bums me out that it happens so much. I mean, there is a chance it could be in some book that they want it to be just uh, their intellectual property and the book is not available in like ebook form. I did find a variety of photos labeled online as, you know, like ghost caught in Woodchester Mansion. Yeah. And unfortunately, they were terrible. Oh, no. Really small. I'm always like bummed out by that with a like, technology we have now. Yeah. Tiny, like, you you know, there's no very grainy. You know, when you try to like zoom in, it's like you can't tell grain from shadow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, there'll be things circled on the photos. And I will include those if I think there's anything to them. Yeah. They were really, really bad. So, uh, eh, what do you do? But I do have some pictures of the building itself. It's very interesting because that, of that whole like long unfinished situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this first is an exterior shot of Woodchester Mansion. It's so cold in here. I, I kind of like it. So yeah, okay. big, big building. Well, it looks finished. <laughs> yeah, the outside, the exterior is finished. But then you go inside, like here's a pic of uh, some unfinished interior portion of the building. Okay, okay. See so the like ladder. structural. Mm -hmm. And they didn't finish that archway. They got the wood there kind of holding things in place. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just not totally completed. And then this next one's a completely unfinished room. And there's a variety of rooms like this in there. Got it. Okay, yep, yep. 
And then uh, this next one, a room that is finished. The rooms that are finished, gorgeous. Oh, wow. That was like a fundraiser they held. In I was just going to say, ago. is that a wedding? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's uh, this random mix inside this building of some rooms completely finished that are like very elegant. Yes. And then uh, so many others, not finished at all. Uh, here is another finished area of the mansion. And again, it's just, it's beautiful. Oh my God. <laughs> Stunning. All that and all that limestone, just like so heavy. Yeah. Uh, and then one more, just a creepy unfinished part of that cellar system. This is where they uh, were doing, you know, heard that moan somewhere around here. <sighs> yeah, the, I would. I would not want to be down there. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking though, like of all the places that we've talked about, it, it feels like these ghost encounters are pretty tame. Yes. Maybe it's not such a bad place. Like if you're really wanting to experience something. Yeah. They, they do like lots a of minor. ghost hunts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was reading some, I was, you know, prepping for this episode and uh, I was reading some stories and somebody wrote like, you know, tell Dan, you know, like you think you want to have something happen and you think that I like, know. oh, if it's going to happen, I just want it to be like minor. But they said like, yeah, but once that happens, that's it. All bets are off. And forever after that. Yep. You're just constantly questioning, like, is that real? Is that not real? Did this happen? Did that not happen? Like, it really messes with you. I know. Well, I, I think about my very minor possible little thing yeah. at that rainbow room yeah. in LA, and that was so slight. I know. But, but even that one, I still I, I still just gets in my head sometimes just because I can't, like, rationally ex figure it out. Well, and then to have it confirmed. Right. To take it for what it is. And to have other people waitress. say. Mm -hmm, and then people, because of our show. Did you just lower your chair? Nope. Oh, he, just changed my position. Oh, I was like, what's going on? He's moving. <laughs> and just, uh, you know, I've had other people say that they've experienced something similar in that place. Yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, if it was something more intense, like um, like like seeing like a, a, a the definite outline of a shadowy apparition, like, like they were talking about, like just cross the corridor. Yeah. Something that you and somebody else verify is seeing the same thing. Yeah, because then you it would just it would just get in your head, and you're like, well, what else is out there? I know, and that but I, but I do. I kind of want because I mean, I'm so fascinated with this whole world. Obviously, to want to do this podcast, yeah. I just don't know how intense I want the experience to be. But again, that what this person was saying I know, is doesn't like, matter. it doesn't matter because that's it. Then then you're forever changed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of like that thing of like you can't unknow something. I know. You, you know, in a in a relationship, you think you want to know some specific detail about your partner's past and then you find out you're like, oh, I wish I didn't know that because you can't unknow it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just let that sit there. <laughs> is, there any, is there anyone you're thinking of? Is there anyone I'm thinking? Of? Oh, no, like like uh, um, moments. You're like, oh, I wish I didn't know that. Is that, yeah, is that, yeah, yeah, or some? Yeah, oh, man. Of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Remember that time I found that? Uh, oh, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, what? It's just, you know, remnants of a former relationship. Like, you, yep. can't, you can't unsee it. You can't unknow it. And then it, totally. it, no matter how secure, and, but I think about that when you apply that to the paranormal, no matter how secure you are with, you know, your ability to like live in this life and understand yeah. that there's another life and all these different things. And you can have such peace. You can, um, if you're religious, you can have comfort in religion to know that your God will meet you on the other side. Like yeah. all those things. It doesn't matter how good that feels. As soon as you know that there is something definitely, as soon as you see that apparition, you have mm -hmm. that moment, all bets are off. Yeah. You're yeah. forever like, ugh, a little creepy. Mm-hmm. All right. Are you and Layla ready to go on a little journey with me? Yes, we are. Okay, great. Well, so often on this show, we talk about, uh, you know, spirits showing up and not being who we think they are. You know, they mm -hmm. present themselves as like your grandma or whatever. And then it's like, dun, dun, dun. That's just they, kidding. That's how they get you. I know. And I wish that there were some rules, some like <laughs> some rule book somewhere that would tell you like, okay, the thing about it is like, if you think it's your grandma, you yeah. ask it these three questions, and then if it answers them correctly, like you're good to go. But if it doesn't, yeah. or if it says this, then like, uh, you know. I'm picturing, and this is from movies. I don't even know if it's actually factually accurate, but just the whole thing of like someone's trying to do a drug deal, and they're like, "You're not a cop, are you?" <laughs> Like, you have like, to disclose like, you have yourself. To tell me. You have to tell me if you're a cop. I'm yeah. asking, are you a cop? Yeah, because uh, what is it? <laughs> I'm asking, what, are you a demon? If you, what is it with a cop? It's like if you ask. It's like baiting them or something. There's something, a specific term for it. I want to use that term for ghosts. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't lie to me. Because if right. you do, you can't take me to court on it. It's too bad. <laughs> right, I asked right. you directly. Oh my God. Your possession gets thrown out of paranormal court. Oh, oh. Well, I wonder too, it's like that thing of if you acknowledge it, 
it becomes real. So it's like, where's that line too? Where it's like, I didn't acknowledge the evil thing. I only acknowledged my grandma. Why do you mm-hmm. get to come through with her? Yeah, yeah. You little trigger. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I love this story because I think it really plays to that you know, if you acknowledge it, it's there, Mm -hmm. but also like trusting your gut of like, if it feels off, like if you see something and you're like, I don't know, that doesn't feel good. I'm just going to ignore it. Maybe that is the best policy. Okay. Okay. Hey, Dan and Lindsay, I wanted to share my own story with the creepy, mysterious and paranormal. I consider myself a closet believer in the paranormal. Part of why I say I'm a closet believer is because I feel that openly accepting it means I might be allowing things into my life whose existence I would rather remain in blissful ignorance of. I was raised in a Catholic Adventist household. My brother and I were always told monsters don't exist and that when you die, your spirit just sleeps until Christ's second coming. We lived on a chicken farm on the outskirts of town in a beautiful house that my dad had built on a 10-acre piece of property. I have a lot of fond memories growing up on that farm with my little brother, Atlas. However, there was a period of time where my brother and I were experiencing some some strange occurrences. I was nine and my brother was seven. We were playing in our playroom that sat between our two bedrooms on the second floor of the house. As we were playing, I noticed a small figure in my peripheral vision standing in the doorway and it looked like a little boy. My first thought was that some of the members of our church had been invited over by our parents for a Saturday afternoon potluck, and he was just one of their kids. We had these potlucks at least twice a month with our church members, but I could never keep track of which Saturday they were planned for. I would just see that we had guests bringing in a lot of food, and then my brother and I would make our plans to sneak some extra desserts to save for later. I turned to the little boy to invite him in to play with us, but when I did, there was no one there. I shrugged it off and figured it was simply my imagination, and I went back to playing with my brother. After this event, my mother recalls that I started to have night terrors almost every night where I would wake up screaming. Now, I don't remember any of this, but she said she would run up the stairs to check on me and would find me in a fearful, trance-like state. I would eventually snap out of it after a few shakes, but it was happening every time. And I would always look beyond my mother at my closed closet door or look frantically around the room, clearly searching for something. I started sleeping with a blanket that I would hang over my bed like a tent. I had developed a fear of waking up and seeing something staring back at me from the darkness of my closet or the edge of my bed. This blanket fortress I created seemed (laughs) to help me fall asleep and eventually I had no more night terrors. However, The little boy did still make appearances at night and now sometimes during the day as well. He would always be just in the corner of my eye and then would disappear whenever I would turn to get a better look. My brother also began to experience the same thing. I had a friend over one day and we were playing in the playroom again when suddenly we heard a knocking. We stopped to listen and eventually the knocking subsided. We chalked it up to the house settling and got back to playing our games. But a couple minutes later, after the knocking, I suddenly felt very scared. I looked up from what I was doing and saw that my friend and my brother were also exchanging fearful glances at one another. They had felt it too, a creepy presence. I casually said, uh, hey, do you guys want to go play outside for a little bit before dinner? My friend nodded eagerly and my brother instantly bolted from the room shouting, race you downstairs. But, but I could tell from the shakiness of his voice that he was trying to remain calm and lighthearted like I was. Something told us that acknowledging the fearful presence was a bad idea. The entire way down the stairs, I felt like something was watching us, but I didn't dare look back. The last event I remember as a kid was where I experienced the apparition of the little boy or that overwhelming sense of fear when my brother and I were in the basement watching cartoons. We had just decided to turn off the lights to watch a movie, and towards the end, I suddenly felt that overwhelming sense of fear. My brother and I exchanged glances, turned off the movie, turned on the lights, and waited. After a while of standing there still and quiet, waiting for the fear to pass, a door creaked open on its own. It had been completely shut and there was absolutely no way that any draft could have caused it to open. The sense of fear turned to terror as the smell of a foul odor, almost like rotten eggs, took over the room. I didn't know what it was, but I knew we had to get out of that room. Go! I shouted at my brother, and my brother ran for the stairs, me following close behind. When we got to the top, we shut off the lights. As we closed the door, I made eye contact with a dark, smiling face at the bottom of the stairs. 
God. The figure was the same height and size as the little boy my brother and I had been seeing, but he didn't look like a child anymore. I mean, he did, but he was like distorted almost. I slammed the door and my brother and I slept in the same room for weeks after this. And we never told our parents since, like I mentioned, believing or entertaining these stories of monsters and ghosts was just not part of the Adventist theology. And Mm. I didn't want to have to talk to a pastor and hear the same old, well, it's not real, just pray on it. Eventually the fear of whatever it was that we were seeing passed and there were no more sightings, And eventually my parents divorced a few years later and sold the house. The house was bought by a family who now grows a vineyard and built a winery on the property. I sometimes visit my old farm and buy a bottle of wine (laughs) and then visit the new owners. I was talking with the owner during one of my visits. And as I was recalling funny stories and details of growing up on a chicken farm, he suddenly asked me, did you ever encounter anything odd while living here? Like what? I asked. Well, my daughter has been seeing this little boy running around. Sometimes she also hears a knocking. We had a priest come in and bless the house and the sightings seemed to have stopped, but I was curious if you ever saw him or had similar encounters while you were living here. I froze and nodded, feeling that fear coming back. The owner continued, she said the boy didn't seem scary, but I personally never trust anything from the spirit world. You never know what it might actually be. True. I said, as I started to recall Mm -hmm. that night in the basement, I changed the subject as I didn't want to get into the details about what we saw. Just talking about it made me scared that it would come back again. I thanked him for the wine and I went home. Your fan, Camry. Thank you, Camry. I love that story. Yeah. That Uh, like final confirmation. That nice button at the end. No. Just, you know, especially not only like mentioning a little boy, but that he has a little girl visited by a little boy. And that there's been like knocking, just like so many of the similarities. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, interesting that they did do a blessing and it seemed to have went away. Yeah. I also I also liked in that story, and uh, and sorry if I missed, if it was mentioned, the age difference between her and her brother. Uh, nine and seven, I think she Oh, okay. Because I knew it was close, but I couldn't remember the exact. Just when that, after they got scared, when they like shared that room for a few weeks, that's pretty adorable. I know. That is so cute. I love them banding together. I know. I know. protection. Because they also know that like mom and dad aren't mm-hmm. going to believe us. And and even if they do, they're going to like poo-poo it. Yeah. That, that at that age, they already knew that they would be told just to prey on it. Yep. But fascinatingly to me is when this new owner says like we did have a priest come in and it stopped. I mean- as a kid, it's like you just want to be believed by your parents no matter what you tell them. Like, yeah. you come home from school and it's like, no, he did hit me. You know, like yeah, yeah, all yeah. of that. Mm-hmm. So it's like, if these children would have been believed by their parents had they told them, maybe it would have stopped long before this new family moved in. Like, maybe mm-hmm. it really just needed a cleansing of sorts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that like thing of like running up the stairs and feeling like something is behind you. I mean, we've all felt yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And that I don't know what that stems from. I mean- I know a lot of it. things, I'm sure. Like, if that, if that was the only thing that happened, I wouldn't necessarily think paranormal. Right, right. Well, and it's a, like I'm thinking about in our lives, like even when I come up the stairs in our basement, I always get that feeling. And I don't know if it's mm-hmm. because we've picked up on it from tropes, from horror movies, or like why we all feel that. But if any time I turned around and there yeah. was something actually smiling at me. My God. Right? Like that confirms yeah, your biggest fear of running up the stairs in the dark. Blah. Yeah, that yeah, that part was uh, creepy. The little d- distorted uh, version of the boy down there. Mm-hmm. And how funny that the dad, the new owner, is like, ah, I don't trust it, no yeah. matter what. I'm like, mm-hmm. man, you're so smart. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that running away, like that, you know, that feeling. If there's, you know, not something back there, is some kind of evolutionary thing where it's like, because I get the same feeling sometimes, like coming up the stairs from a dark place that I will get swimming to the shore from someplace, which oh, would make sense. Yes. Where it's like if you're swimming and you can't see what's behind you, it's like our ancestors did get eaten all the time by like, you know, the alligators, like a predatory crocodiles, feeling. or you're running because something is chasing you and you're like running for your life. I wonder if it's a little like uh, echo of that. That makes sense. Because it makes me think about like the dogs, like um, uh, the little echoes of their past in them. Mm-hmm. You know, we have these two little doodles, obviously Penny and Dee Dee, who they couldn't, they couldn't kill anything. Out there. Maybe a bird or a squirrel, maybe. I mean, Gigi, Gigi has brought could. some mice. Yeah, Gigi has brought some ice, I guess. But just like, you know, <laughs> it's like they go into like wolf mode when someone knocks at the door 
or yeah. something. Because I'm sure like, you know, hundreds of years ago when there was a disturbance out there, the, the pack did have to band together mm-hmm. and make a bunch of noise to scare something off. It's like, well, you little fluffy idiots <laughs> aren't scaring anything. And come on, that's the same post office person or the, you know, UPS driver that you've seen for two years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just like their little instinct takes over. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. I love that analogy of just I think we have connecting that stuff in it us. to our our past. It would mm-hmm, make sense. Mm-hmm. And you and I were just talking about this, like about relationally, how um mm. like women are so much more talkative and communicative and yeah. um desire a sense of community generally more than men and then mm-hmm. you relate it to like well yeah because men were out in woods hunting and you know had to be hunched down quiet yeah. f- like singularly focusing on one yeah. thing by themselves where women were left back at a village and had to yeah. band together to cook and take care of the babies when you said that to me i was like ding 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 that makes so much sense yeah because hunter gatherers like we were hunter gatherers for so much longer than we've been civilized yeah and um, yeah, and if you're just in some little tribe or whatever, like like women couldn't hunt as much because you know they're pregnant, yeah, uh, and, and and they're not as fast when they're pregnant and all those things, and then it just makes sense for them to like stay in like the nest or the mm-hmm. cave or whatever and protect the young, but they have to like work with other people while they're recovering. So yeah, communication was encouraged. Where the dudes that are out hunting, real quiet, singular mission, we're trying to kill this thing. And we're going to quietly throw a few signals. But for the most part, like if anybody's like been hunting, like if you're, you know, kind of taking it somewhat seriously, you're just quiet. You're just sitting out there and being quiet. Yeah. Because if you talk, you're going to spook things away. And it's, yeah, it's just very like, I think men's brains got wired to just be like, I'm going to focus on this one thing all day long. Yeah. So again, just an echo, just another yeah. example of like echoes of our past. Yep. That's why we cannot multitask for shit today. A lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, keeping in what does Kyler do? He goes, oh, oh I'm a terrible uh, multitasker. Keeping in step with our first story, uh, this is another tale about something feeling off and just, you know, yeah. maybe like being cautious about what you acknowledge. Hey, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I work at a long term mental health care facility for teenagers. Most that come to this program will stay for at least a year and are dealing with serious issues like major depression, suicidal ideation, and self harm. Most have had quite a bit of trauma, as you can imagine. I specifically work the overnight shift, and for the most part, it is, thankfully, very quiet, which is great because we only have four staff members at night with four areas of the campus that have patient rooms. The layout of the campus means that we usually don't see each other on the night shift unless we ask for help. It is a well-known fact amongst the overnight staff that the place has some weird occurrences. uh, The more skeptical among the team always have rational excuses. It was the wind, the wiring, it's an old building, etc., the more superstitious of the team are sure the place is haunted. When I first started working here, I was one of the more skeptical ones. But over the three years I've been here, I've become much more of a believer. Some of the more benign things that have happened are lights turning on and off when no one's in the room, the sound of footsteps in empty hallways, doors opening and closing on their own, and the like. There have been the occasional more intense things as well, though these are few and far between. Over the years I've worked here, I've come to the belief that the occurrences that we have are quite possibly the relatives of patients. I started having this belief as the occurrences will sometimes get worse around certain patients, usually those that have significant trauma around a close family member passing away. With those occurrences, I have no issue as I simply see them as a friendly spirit watching over a family member going through their own difficult time. However, this did not seem like one of those instances. One night, about a year ago, I was finishing up a check on the patients. We complete a physical check-in where we're able to see each and every patient and we do this every 15 minutes. I had stepped outside to head to the other side of the campus when I noticed something odd. I couldn't figure out what it was at first, but there was definitely a strange feeling in the air. And that's when I noticed how quiet it was. I live in a desert area where summer lasts from April to September and temperatures range from 80 degrees at night to 120 degrees during the day. If I was given the option of moving to hell, I'd take it as I have (laughs) no doubt it would be more tolerable than my hometown. One of the absolute worst parts of the excessive heat is the bugs. Starting in April and May, 
hundreds of cockroaches show up. Ugh. They crawl out of whatever hole they've burrowed into for the winter and cover everything. They aren't afraid of people and they're nearly unkillable. So you have to keep an eye out when you're walking around and you have to carry something with you to swat the flying ones out of the Ugh. air. Further into the summer, around June and July, is when the spiders show up. Dozens of them all swarming the area to make a feast of the cockroaches that have been making the place home. Around that time, you have to start carrying around something to not only swat away the cockroaches, but also something that will kill the large spiders and <laughs> dozens of babies they're carrying on their backs. Yeah. I tell you this all so that you understand just how weird it is to be outside in the middle of June and not hear one single insect. No cockroach, no spider, no cricket, no cicadas, nothing. Normally, I'd be singing hallelujah that the bugs were all gone and I didn't need to worry about a cockroach, you know, crawling into my ear or a spider spilling its babies into my shoes, both of which have happened to me and make me question why I still live here. But anyways, <laughs> this was simply too weird and there was a horrible feeling in the air. It felt like I was being watched and not just watched, but glared at, like someone was trying to kill me with their eyes alone. And on this night, in the middle of the summer, in the 80-degree weather, it somehow felt freezing cold. I was freaked out, and I decided I needed to get back inside immediately. I bolted for the door of the closest building, slamming and locking the door behind me. I still felt weird, but I thought I should be safe inside, so I went ahead and completed my checks. That night, nothing else happened. I would still feel that menacing stare occasionally throughout the night, but... I finished out my shift and headed home, none the worse for the wear. The next couple of nights, I felt that menacing stare and I also began to hear footsteps in the hallways and lights began flickering. I mostly brushed it off as yet more weirdness of the facility. However, about a week of this in, the missing insects and the horrible feeling of being glared at, it all came to a head. I was sitting in a small living room area that had two doorways, one to a patient room and bathroom, and one to a hallway that led to two more patient rooms. That night, I heard footsteps again in the hallway, and I got up to see if it was someone needing something from me. Looking down the hall, I saw no one, but could still hear the footsteps. As I stared down the dark hallway, shining a flashlight, trying to figure out if I was really hearing footsteps or not, it grew louder and faster as if someone was running down the hallway directly towards me. It freaked God. me out and I jumped back like I was dodging being hit. The footsteps stopped suddenly right before they reached where I was standing. I quickly did a check on all of the patients in my area and found them all to be sound asleep. Figuring that it was simply just another one of those odd occurrences, I went to sit on the couch in the living room once again. While I was there counting down the minutes until the next patient check, the lights in the hallway began flickering on and off. Getting back up to check once again that it was not a patient in need, I jumped out of my skin when the door of the bathroom flew open with a loud bang and a fire suddenly started in there. I ran and pulled the fire alarm, evacuated all of the patients, and called the fire department. God. The fire department was able to put the fire out quickly as it wasn't that large by any means. They chalked it up to some bad wiring. The next night, I came in to find a lot of the patients were still freaked out. It was discovered that a couple of patients had made their own Ouija board and <laughs> had been using it to freak one another out. Those patients were placed on line of sight for a while, meaning they were never to be without the sight of the staff on them at all times. Even the daytime staff had begun to notice the odd occurrences, which was new because previously only the night staff had ever experienced anything paranormal. Over the next week, the tension continually increased until eventually one of the therapists determined it was a good idea to bring in a local rabbi in an attempt to calm the patients. I don't know exactly what he did, but I do know that after he came, things seemed to be exceptionally calmer. Mm. The bugs returned immediately after he came, and I no longer felt that malicious presence staring at me. Slowly, the staff calmed and the patients felt comfortable again. I still occasionally hear footsteps or see a flickering light, but they all seem to be the occurrences that I attribute to benign family spirits. And as far as the patients and day staff are concerned, there have been no more further incidents on campus. I don't know what the hell that thing was that ter terrorized the facility for those two weeks, but I will never forget it. Very. Like V-E-R-I. Very? Very? I don't know how to say that name. V-E-R-I. Very. Very, I think. Very, yeah, yeah, think. probably. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm just going to call you V. V. Because <laughs> I'm not sure. V for Vendetta. Um, oh, yeah. 
man, I, I uh, there was like one section that stuck with me the most right before the fire and the flickering lights. Uh-huh. That whole thing of, um, I feel like this had to have come up at some point in the past, but I just can't remember. Actually, I know it has. I just can't remember specifically which story. But it, and it always freaks me out when it does. Is the quickening footsteps? Yes. Uh, in your direction, that is terrifying. Like if you're here, just. Like it really starts to like, yeah. pick, and, and the sound is coming towards you. Right, it's getting louder and louder. Uh, just like the tension you would feel, like what is about to, uh, you know, face me. What, yeah. what, what am I about to see? I and love. A lot of times you don't even see anything, but just that right. feeling would still remain. I love that they like jumped out of the way because that's what I would do. I would like yeah. jump back, press myself against the wall. Like I don't yeah. want any trouble. Let oh, me get out of your way. God, and then what if you just felt something like cold, like a zoom past you as you're like flattened against the wall. And then the fire was uh That was new. Scary. I'm like, what yeah. the heck? I mean, there have been fires. It's been a while, but there have been like things where it's like, you know, a, a poltergeist activity. And then part of it is like fires keep breaking out. Yeah, which like is small little. Little fires, which is the scariest mm-hmm. to me. Because like, oh, this thing is trying to kill us. Like, yeah. Th- th- you know, we can die. I've, I mean, in my mind, I was like, well, it's good that the fire happened in a bathroom where, you know, it's harder for fire to spread. Like right. I had all these rational thoughts, but knowing that it was a mental health care facility, it really mm-hmm. kind of bothered me because it's like you already have people who are dealing with heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. What if the patients are hearing and seeing things and they can't communicate it properly? Right. Because they're probably in all likelihood medicated to some degree. Yeah. And then if you're relaying this to your therapist in this mental health facility where you've gone to get help, where you've gone to get better, seeking positive treatment, and you're like, and I'm hearing things, and they're like, okay, schizophrenic, Mm -hmm, paranoid. mm -hmm. That is such an awful, awful thing to me because it's like, I mean, thankfully (sighs) in this situation, the staff is experiencing it as well. And it sounds like this therapist, I mean, brought in the rabbi to to bless the facility. So there was some, for people who are mentally well Mm -hmm. them to be also experiencing it gave me some relief that like they weren't just going to continue to medicate and misdiagnose these patients but how often do you think that could happen well that scenario reminds me of smile that movie we saw where it's like that was one yeah yeah that was one of the elements i loved about it was taking you know place partially uh, in a psychiatric facility with this um i think our character was it was yeah, I think it was psychiatrists. I think it was like a medical facility. Mm-hmm. So not just psychologists, but psychiatrists. And then just her skepticism. I don't want to ruin the movie for people, but it's just like, just that element added so much terror to me. Yeah, yeah. Where, where then, you know, people aren't going to take you seriously because like you just said, they're just going to think like you need to be medicated or mm-hmm. you're just part of your What's uh, wrong with you? You're crazy. Illness. You're losing mm-hmm. it. Yeah, like all those, you know, kind of throwaway phrases that we say yeah. that are so damaging in these kinds of situations. Yeah, totally. So dismissive. Ah, wild. <laughs> cool and interesting. Oh, we haven't said that in a while. <laughs> I know. I'm, fi- I'm finally getting more relaxed where occasionally when I say like interesting now, I'm like, it's fine. It's, it's fine. fine. It's, it's fine. fine. Just let it go. It's, let it's it go. It's word everybody says. Move along. Do you uh, want to thank some Annabelle's? Some I, new, fresh, new Annabelle's? Fresh, hot off the press. And mm-hmm. with a few, I did not asterisk them in any way, but there were a few that were like, oh, hey, I never got mine. So if, you, oh, if okay. you've never gotten yours, the system is not... Perfect. Mm-hmm. So please feel free to shoot an, uh, an email to info at scared to death podcast.com so that if you haven't gotten your Annabelle shout out, we can get it. Okay. I'd like to thank the following people Creep Camp, <laughs> Mom Huffman, Wanda Lovejoy, which is my favorite name of the week. Wanda Lovejoy. Wanda Lovejoy, I love sexual you. therapist. Oh, okay. Christopher Lamarita, <laughs> Tess Yu, Quinn Schultz, Greta Wilson. Stink a stink, <laughs> Cassandra Martinez and Zachary Turner. Stink a stink. Stink a stink. Thank stink-a-stink. you. And I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's as well: Cat Attack, uh, Jonita uh, Scaplin, Aiden LeBanc, uh, and then this one. I would thank thanks for the pronunciation guide because n- I never would have gotten close to this one. Sarah Check, but I would have said Sarah Seach or Sarah Sec or something. I would have known it was Sarah simply because of Michael Sarah. Oh yeah. But the, the last C-E-R-A. name I would never have gotten R-A. correct. Uh, Beth Joyce, uh, Aaron Billingsley, Iris Ferrari. Aaron? Fer- oh, Aaron. A-R-Y-N. I, I don't think I've seen that spelling before. Yeah. Aaron Billingsley, uh, Iris Fer- Ferretta, Alejandro Cernas Martinez, uh, Anonymous Finger. Got to hook them up with Wanda Lovejoy. <laughs> and Patrick. <laughs> Patrick. Oh, Mick. McAuliffe? McAuliffe, M C A U L I F F E. McAuliffe. McAuliffe. Patrick McAuliffe. Patrick Patrick McAuliffe. Very nice. Very okay. nice. Uh 
I have, I want us to like uh, keep doing little like love matches. Mm, yeah. Like I'll pick my favorite and then oh. like you can say like, oh, I think that they should be with so-and-so. Some intimate connections. And then you guys can find each other on Patreon and let us know what happened. <laughs> These people, everyone's like, we're married. Stop right. it. We're not swingers. <laughs> I'm 11. <laughs> <laughs> my mom bought me this for Christmas. <laughs> right, right. Like, ugh, my uh. bad. Uh, okay, a couple of spooky shout outs this week. To Daniel from Madison, I glub you. And thank you for being my person. I love Cute. how all relationships have like a secret little language. Yep, I know. I was talking to somebody about this who they were like telling me that they have um, people that they're friends with who do their like weird, creepy baby behind the scenes talk in front of everyone. I'm like, that is awful. No one wants that. <laughs> Nobody. Uh, to David from Gina, happy birthday. I love you. You're the light in my life that never goes dull. Oh, I know. So sweet. happy. Today's Valentine's Day as we're recording this. So it's on like, oh, so, so sweet. Will you be my Valentine? Okay. Okay, yes. I, yes. I had to think about if I had other options. I got a hot Valentine. Just kidding. Uh, to Andrew Long Pooper from your dad, Ron. <laughs> Happy birthday. Oh, there's a story there. Oh, yeah. Well, he probably knows Kyler coming. I know. I just thought that. <laughs> to Emily, Tristan, and big brother Alaric from Tyler, Scarlett, and Jace. Congrats on baby number two. <laughs> to Sean from Yeggs, Holden, Gray, and Diddy. Happy birthday. You're the best dad and the best friend ever. And to Corey <laughs> from Maggie, I love you. Aww. Uh, and that is our show. That was so sweet. Uh, thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith and Tyler C for the work on social media and Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thank you to Logan for producing and directing today, Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Store emails, and to book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener tales for book number four. And I should thank Ryan Handelsman and his team for social media as well. <laughs> Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for finding the first story I told this week and to Sarah Finch for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch this show. Uh, or you can watch little snippets, highlights on TikTok at Scared to Death Podcast. Come on, guys. Make us TikTokers. <laughs> I want to prove to my kids I'm cool. <laughs> Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want to uh, see the pictures that accompany the episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. Uh, we have a private Facebook group creeps and peepers if you want to meet some fellow horror lovers and if you don't want to hear any ads if you want bunth monthly bonus episodes <laughs> if you want monthly if you want episodes. monthly bonuses check out our patreon get the entire catalog ad free and more wanda lovejoy can probably tell you about bonuses oh yeah uh-huh wanda you get wanda lovejoy and anonymous finger together it's gonna be all kinds of crazy stuff happening uh enjoy your nightmares creeps and peepers hope you were scared to death oh god bye y'all if spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. Bad Magic Productions. Remember that time I found that? Uh, oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>